All right, what's that, babe? You're gonna, you're gonna put the Ark of the Covenant back in the tomb? Okay, yeah, just don't, just make sure that doesn't get out that we got that. That's kind, that's kind of a big deal. Ooh, welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today I have a fun channel announcement, and that is that Fantasy News will from henceforth be moved to Friday, not Saturday. I'm simply putting it on this day because I needed more time since Tuesday, but yes, from now on, you will be getting Fantasy Newses on Friday. And this is largely due to the fact that I was very frequently having to deal with news drops throughout the week. I'm I'm late to it by covering it early next week and then I'm just late to everything that happens the next so now I'll be following the typical news patterns and coming at the end of the week so next Tuesday you'll be getting something else but we're gonna go ahead and kick off this episode of fantasy news with an exciting Cosmere announcement it feels like we haven't gotten a good chunk of Cosmere news in a while and I'm happy to reporting there'll be a new edition of the covers for the stormlight archive. These are definitely a much more pulled back minimal cover, which I like quite a bit, but it's not my preferred style. Just a good execution of something I can appreciate, but won't be on my shelf necessarily. And that's largely due to the fact that I enjoy the painted canvas we very often get, especially for epics like Cosmere and Stormlight Archive related things. That being said though, I can definitely see this being quite the hit because of how many people do wait to buy editions of books to better match their shelves aesthetics. And there's this whole industry that's coming to life around bringing new additions to people. In somewhat related news, The Broken Binding has just released their new subscription box service for books, and they're beginning it with the Blade Itself Special Edition hardback. Full disclosure, they have sponsored me here before, but I'm covering this for free because I just think it's really cool. As a fan, I'm really excited for this this blooming industry that seems to just be taking off out of nowhere, where there's actually people just getting in touch with authors and publishers and being like, hey, can we do a special edition run? Because you're not doing a new printing right now. And it just gives fans the opportunity to find better covers for what they think matches their shelf aesthetic. It's a win-win. But continuing on from there, we had a very huh, piece of Wheel of Time news. And I'm gonna get to say some words here I didn't think I'd be able to say in my adult life, but that comes with a massive caveat. We're getting a new Wheel of Time book about the making of the series, not the show, the books. Announcing origins of the Wheel of Time, the legends and mythologies that inspired Robert Jordan with a letter written from the author, as well as actually two new pieces of series content with some quotes on that. There'll be a new edition of the Wheel of Time maps, apparently containing changes Robert Robert Jordan wanted from his notes. That definitely involves a differently sized Sean Chan and a non-canonical scene that takes place within the eye of the world. Now I'm not poo-pooing the whole idea of this making of the Wheel of Time thing. I actually think it's something that should be done for more series. I'd love to have things like this put out for Malazan about all the inspirations and influences that came to the author to allow them to create their cultures, worlds, magic systems. Sign me up. I just think because there's been so much yelling and infighting, especially around me within the Wheel of Time community recently, any piece of Wheel of Time news, I just kind of internally go, Ugh. But hey, there's no way this comment section can turn to hell. No way at all. But let's go ahead and flip on over to some gorgeous news as we're gonna go ahead and talk about the announcement for the cover of The Dragon's Promise by Elizabeth Lim. And speaking of painted canvas-like covers, this is just popping with color and attitude. Plus, there's a big old thickum dragon right there. I love me a scaly boy and it instantly increases my chance to buy your book by at least 10%. What's that? What are you saying, Michael Moorcox fans? You want an omnibus edition of the Elric Melnibone saga? Well, I have great news for you because Tor has revealed an omnibus edition of Michael Moorcox's Elric of Melnibone. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I have not gotten to these stories yet. Now, what's extra exciting about these, though, is apparently they're going to be in chronological order, but also in the edition the author specifically prefers. This is the first time it's been released like this in the United States. And apparently we are also getting a new Michael Moorcock book called The Citadel of Forgotten Myths. And this prequel will be released December. So that dropped really early in the morning. Can you tell? Can, can you tell? I got it though, I got it. 
Now, cyberpunk fans can rejoice this week as they are getting ever so closer to actually getting the game they were initially promised on release with the 1.5 patch. How bitter was that supposed to be? A little. The 1.5 patch solves several key issues that players have been complaining about since the game's release, like odd POV within cars, but maybe even more excitingly, we are also getting next gen or sorry, current generational console support, as well as some new actual game content. Is this enough to make me re play the game yet? No. When you had the official 2.0, I'll try it again. And in news that almost felt inevitable has been long rumored, but is finally confirmed, a Bioshock movie is officially on the way from Netflix. And I have played some of the Bioshock games. I'm by no means the biggest fan, but the number one hurdle to me, it seems, in bringing Bioshock to life correctly is the world. It is so personality filled and so integral to the story, the atmosphere, that that's next level. I would say even more so than The Witcher. It is going to take an incredible amount of effort to fully realize that environment. Immediately, my mind is jumping to, do they use that new Mandalorian technology with the screens in the dome, or to be more practical, if that can even be done with the scale of sets you'd need, or finally, if it's gonna be just a more traditional green screen. I got no idea, but I'm, very interested to see where this goes. And in quickie news, it looks like we're going to be getting a new I Am Legend adaptation from Warner Brothers. Will this one actually be faithful to the book? We just don't know. There actually was another I Am Legend adaptation before the Will Smith one, so go watch that if you'd also like to see them not be loyal to the book. And in news I used to take as just a great sign for any adaptation, but now I see as just more of the doubling down on an investment in hopes that you could, if it fails season one, do better season two. The Halo TV show over at Paramount Plus has been early renewed for a season two. It's not bad news. If it was just a total dumpster fire, they would not be doing this, but it's not the guarantee of quality up front. Some people, including myself, absolutely used to think. The new streaming age is seeing a lot of strange behavior that we need to see if it stick around or not for the development of projects like this. And early renewals seem to be a pretty prevalent practice that's going to be around for the next few years. And in news that in no way, shape or form has even the slightest chance of just starting a screaming match in my comments sections, the Lord of the Rings Rings of Power teaser that aired during the Super Bowl broke records by actually achieving 257 million views in its first day. The response to this trailer I have seen be all over the place. I did a poll myself on my Twitter that kind of lined up to where I'm feeling. With something this short, I hate to judge too harshly in either direction, but there were definitely a few angles that went, oh, that looks great, and a couple other angles for me that I was like, that that doesn't seem right. But I will hold off all major judgment until I'm able to actually consume the first few episodes. Josh Brolin has actually made some headlines as well recently by coming out and speaking on the fact that Denis Villeneuve did not get nominated for Best Director for Dune. And all I can say is the Oscars got something wrong? Color me shocked. And in the final story of the day, in terms of franchises that I have just the most childhood warm fuzzies thinking about, few come anywhere near the Alien franchise. And it's, in my opinion, kind of on this teetering point where it could be remembered as a pillar of great science fiction, or if we get some more Alien for Alien vs. Predator crap, it could just be chalked up to schlock and its overall positive legacy overshadowed by its failures. So when I say I'm nervous about this upcoming Alien series, I mean it. But it has been announced that apparently is taking place 70 years in the future on Earth, which is a very comfortable setting for me as a fan. If there's going to be some interesting, actually tactful, thoughtful sci-fi stories left to tell in this franchise, that's where I would set it. The final piece of news connected to this though is that it will begin filming in 2023. Noah Howley, make it good. But this has been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.